Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we have an interview with Dr. Jim Kirkland, a discussion about Utah Raptor Ostromesorum and some dinosaur news. First in the news is an article that was published in the journal PLOS One titled Cranial Anatomy of Wendiceratops Pinhornensis, a Centrosaurian Ceratopsid from Dinosaur Ornithischia from the Old Man Formation, Campanian, Alberta, Canada, and the Evolution of Ceratopsid Nasal Ornamentation. It was published by David Evans and Michael Ray, who are both paleontologists in Canada, and discovered by a fossil hunter named Wendy Slobata. It's named Wendiceratops pinhornensis, and that's obviously after Wendy, who discovered it. It was discovered by her while she was fossil hunting in Alberta, Canada, and in an interview with CNN, she said that she has been fossil hunting and taking photos for paleontologists for many years. She often goes fossil hunting solo, and that was the case when she found this fossil, so later, she led paleontologists Michael Ray and David Evans to the site, and they excavated many remaining bones. As I mentioned, they named the species after Wendy, and the species name refers to Pinhorn Provincial Grazing Reserve, where she found it. David Evans says that she has earned having a dinosaur named after her because she is, quote, easily one of the very best dinosaur hunters in the world. Apparently, Wendy has found so many dinosaur fossils that she has lost count, but it is certainly over a thousand. She has also been to several of the dinosaur hotspots, including Argentina and Mongolia, while taking photos for paleontologists, which sounds like a great job. So they found over 200 bones of the Wendiceratops from all over the body, including many vertebrae, forelimb bones, a hind limb bone, a hip bone, lots of vertebrae, but most importantly, several parts of the skull. They found most of the edge of the frill, as well as a bit of the jaw on the side of its face. The thing that stands out most on Ceratopsians, of course, is the horns, but it looks like they had to make an educated guess at what those looked like due to only one partial horn being found. The authors point out that the early evolution of Ceratopsians is not well known, specifically the span of 90 to 77 million years ago. They describe Wendiceratops as a Centrosaurinae, traditionally the group with the horn by its nose being longer relative to its post-orbital or brow horns, compared with the Chasmosaurinae. You can listen to our episode 30 on Triceratops for more details on the Ceratopsians, which describes both groups in a lot of detail. In that episode, we also mentioned that the Centrosaurinae group tend to have a more decorative but smaller frill relative to the Chasmosaurinae, and the authors of this paper point out that recent discoveries have shown that centrosaurines often also had large horns above their eyes as well, which is what they project with this find too. So far, only a partial nasal horn of Winta's ceratops was discovered, and it was more upright than other related ceratopsians, so they came up with an interesting reconstruction. They ultimately decided that the nasal horn may have had a flat, kind of squared off top rather than coming to a point, and that it extended a little ways down the edge of the snout, so you kind of end up with a plateau-like but real thin <laughs> horn. They decided this because, quote, all surfaces are incomplete, suggesting that the true dimension of the horn core was considerably larger than what is preserved, so they just kind of had to project how big the horn might have grown. They also guessed that the brow horns would look similar to a triceratops, kind of long horns rather than short horns or very little horn at all like you see on some of the centrosaurinae. David Evans said in an interview with NPR that it was about 20 feet long and weighed between 1 and 2 tons, which he describes like the size of a hippo, although when you look at it, it really doesn't look like a hippo. I guess just the weight and overall size is similar. If you want to see a reconstruction of Wendiceratops, there's a full-size model that's now on display at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, so you should check it out if you're in the area. Also in the news, a couple exciting things coming out of Japan. First, the Fukui Prefectural Dinosaur Museum and the city of Nagasaki in Japan said that they found the first Tyrannosauridae teeth in Japan. Before, the only carnivores discovered in the country were of smaller dinosaurs that were about 16 and a half feet or 5 meters tall at most. 
but this Tyrannosauridae could be as tall as 10 meters or 33 feet. The teeth are from the late Cretaceous, around 81 million years ago, and one tooth is 3 inches or 8 centimeters long, 1.5 inches or 3.8 centimeters wide, and 1 inch or 2.7 centimeters thick. Though the teeth were found in 2014, as of July 17th of this year, 2015, they went on display in Nagasaki City. Also in Japan, researchers wrote in the journal Cretaceous Research about finding a patch of rock with 90 fragments of five types of dinosaur eggs. Because there are so many eggs, scientists think it may have been a nesting site. And dinosaur eggs are hard to find because eggs are easily destroyed, and in Japan especially, the, the rock layers are so compressed, it's hard to find them. The eggs were found in southern Japan, they're about 110 million years old, and scientists can tell the species of the egg based on structural patterns that they see under a microscope. Most of the eggs came from small theropods. The eggs actually only weighed 1 to 5 ounces, which are some of the smallest theropod eggs known, but some are also from ornithopods. And last, I just want to give a quick shout out and thank you to a couple of our listeners who've been kind enough to share photos with us on recent trips they've been to see dinosaurs in museums and different sites. So there's Taylor McCoy, who we actually interviewed in episode 8, who shared some pictures of his trip to the Chicago Field Museum, the Black Hills Institute, and the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And also Brenna and her daughter, who shared some pictures with us of their recent trip to the Museum of Science and History in Jacksonville, Florida. And I looked at their site, and I would like to visit it at some point, but from May 23rd to September 7th, if you're in the area, that museum has a Dinosaurs Unearthed exhibit, which shows life-size animatronic dinosaurs. And on July 30th, their After Dark program, which is for adults only, will also feature dinosaurs. So... Thank you both to Brenna and Taylor for sharing your experiences with us. We really appreciate it. And now for our interview with Dr. Jim Kirkland. Dr. Jim Kirkland is the Utah State Paleontologist with the Utah Geological Survey. He has discovered and described a long list of dinosaurs, including the first Jurassic ankylosaur, the oldest horned dinosaur Zuniceratops, and ornithopods such as Eolambia and Velifrons. And, of course, Utah Raptor. He was part of the team who named and described Utah Raptor. He has also authored and co-authored more than 75 professional papers, and he's the adjunct associate professor at the University of Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah, and associate curator of the Natural History Museum of Utah. He's also co-written a Star Trek novel called First Frontier with Diane Carey. And just really quickly, the book's description says that the USS Enterprise is caught in the middle of a Klingon-Romulan battle, and they meet a Klingon who knows nothing about human existence. So Captain Kirk goes to Starfleet headquarters, but once they're back on Earth, the crew finds that Earth is a huge jungle full of large reptilian animals, and Captain Kirk has to travel back in time to figure out what happened. And we'll get into that and more in the interview. What does it mean to be a state paleontologist, and what does that entail? Well, the state of Utah created the position, and there are several states that have state paleontologists, but in Utah, it was basically set up to you know, handle the permitting for you know, qualified researchers who do paleontologic research on state lands. It was known, you know, and it was started about 30 years ago. I'm the, I'm the third state paleontologist the longest reigning, I guess you could call it reigning. <laughs> In addition to, you know, issuing permits, I advised various government agencies about paleo resources in the state of Utah. My office maintains the Utah the paleontological locality database that we use relative to uh, land disturbance issues. You know, if someone's going to do something or change the access of some land, we comment on, you know, what we think it might do relative to Utah's paleo resources. And I basically serve as a cheerleader for all the fossil uh, record of Utah. Because, we, you know, we have one of the most continuous and well-preserved records of the history of life for area this big anywhere on Earth. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we have more dinosaurs than any state in the Union. We have more dinosaurs probably than any country but China. And if I had field money, I'd get up that. And <laughs> 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 but we also have, you know, an amazing paleozoic record. We have one of the, we're just getting ready to publish a book in a week or two on the uh, Middle Cambrian faunas of our West Desert. They're world famous. And we have four different levels where we have Burgess Shale soft body style preservation. 
community, not one level, but four different stratigraphic levels in the state that preserve things of that quality, you know, with a lot of the same characters you see up in Canada and over in China. And, uh, you know, most other countries, these things are in national parks. You know, it's just lots of them in this We have a great record of the early part of the age of mammals and snapshots of the rest of the age of mammals. So you cover a very wide range. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, the terrestrial rocks, you know, for the Mesozoic, actually from the late Paleo, from the Permian, up through the tertiary into the recent. You know, we probably are one of the most continuous records of the last 250 million years of Earth history in any place in the world. It's pretty exciting. We really only have a couple of gaps in the entire record. You know, it's one of those things that, you know, that we post quite often. If you follow me on Facebook or anything, I'm regularly updating our dinosaur faunal list. You know, we, have, we now recognize 27 faunal levels for dinosaurs. You know, and each level has a whole unique menagerie of creatures. I like it. I wonder if we're discovering new ones. You know, kind of like sailing into Australia if you're James Cook and discovering this whole new marvelous world of things that differ you know, everywhere from the big animals like the kangaroos down to the small things like the clams and snails and snakes and lizards and insects, etc. The entire fauna, you know, 27 of these in sequence. Utah, they're, it's the best dated record of, of that type of material practically on the planet. So in my mind, we should be the standard by which at least the Northern Hemisphere tries to tie in the uh, the feet of the, the lockstep of the history of life in the Northern Hemisphere. But you mentioned funding can be an issue sometimes, right? Yeah, we got into, you know, about half of the funding for the Utah Geologic Survey is pegged to what we call mineral lease money. And the price of oil, you know, has got, went down last Christmas big way and went down by almost half. Mm. And that took a huge amount of money out of our budget. And unfortunately, paleontology is not well funded in this country. In other countries, it's actually proportionally much better funded than the United States. And everybody says, well, people donate money. We've been trying to get people donate money for like this Utah Raptor project for six months, and we just haven't come up with anything. You know, all kinds of people say, oh, yeah, 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 and then all of a sudden they vanish. Mm. <laughs> You know, it's very, it's been very depressing. The folks that are working the hardest to try to help us raise the money, class working projects, you know, they just can't believe it. You know, they keep talking to companies and things, it looks good, and all of a sudden, they change their minds. Pretty depressing. Does that mean the project has to be put on hold until you get funding, or how would that work? It's pretty much on hold. I mean, we just uh, gave the pink slip to our... You know, micro preparator Scott Matson. Mm. He's one of the top five micro preparators probably on the planet. And you know, this big block. I'm not sure if you've followed what we've been doing. You know, in the last few months, or mm-hmm. as we try to open this nine ton block filled with Utah Raptors. But I think we're on maybe the third skull of babies. I mean, things that would have skulls a couple inches long. There's an adult in there. There's bunches of juveniles. They're probably like yearlings or two-year-olds, you know, in there, but fairly small. You know, velociraptor-sized ones, and then you know, one big adult, you know, uh, animal that uh, you know would have been, you know, between 800 pounds and 1,000 pounds. But the little stuff. Scott's the only guy in the state, really, that's qualified to prepare a bond suit done under a microscope, and he's got two more weeks with us, and then you know. He's unemployed, and, you know, he's not going to work on this as an unemployed uh, person. So it's been really depressing. So we'll probably probably just pull a tarp over the whole thing until the world changes. (laughs) Oh, that is depressing. It really is. I'm sick about it. I just can't believe that we've had such awful luck. I mean, I don't know what the heck, you know, what it is. I mean, Utah Raptor is the star Jurassic Park. Maybe because we push that as feathered uh, people <laughs> don't want to support it. You know, but we're going to know so much about the animals' growth histories. You know, as we understand how these things were buried. You know, we think this is the first site that's ever been reported to be a mass mortality of 
dinosaurs tied to quicksand. Of course, the scientists refer to it as a uh, large-scale dewatering feature. <laughs> but uh, this thing was on the side of a lake, and, and that's why this stuff's so well preserved. I mean, every jaw we've seen of every animal, including the prey animals, which are guanodons apparently, have all the teeth in the jaws. You know, so the preservation is excellent. But probably the water motion within the quicksand, you know, has kind of pulled some of the skeletons apart. Some may have been pulled apart by scavenging before the animals got stuck. But uh, what's cool about it is, you know, unlike Tarzan movies, you know, where you go in quicksand and, you know, you're sinking away, uh, you know, the last finger's on hand sticking out of it, trying to reach for help as it finally sinks. You don't sink in quicksand completely, but you get stuck. Mm -hmm. And when the water pressure, this churning the sand, you know, and shooting it to the surface, you know, stops, you know, we call the hydraulic head, turns down, the entire feature then can collapse into the ground. And we believe that's what buried these animals while they were still either uh, still juicy or very soon after. <laughs> How many dinosaurs have you, do you know about? Well, since we, you know, we always were saying to people that we had one baby, four juveniles, and one big adult. Since we just started, you know, developing the outside, I mean, finished pulling the cap off it, we found two more babies and at least one more juvenile. So we're up to eight animals, and I expect it to be dozens of animals in that block. And that doesn't count the guanodon. So, you know, you yeah, had the eight and then the juvenile and then the adult the guanodon. Maybe it's the animal we named Hippodraco from another site, the same level, some few miles away, or it could be another taxa. Because there seems to be several kinds of guanodons in that fauna. You know, the others just haven't been named yet. They're being worked on by other scientists. I know it took, what, about 10 years to excavate that block. Yeah, that was mainly because of money, you know, because <laughs> you know, basically, you know, that was a totally unfunded, and, you know, we were doing it with, like, end-of-the-year money, so we'd work a few weeks here and a few weeks there, and and then once we realized that we couldn't take it out in small chunks, because there's so many intertwined skeletons, there's just no way to cut the thing without really destroying a lot of really delicate material, the process of trying to block that thing out and figure out how to get it off the mesa, you know, or Cuesta, it's a, a tilted mesa, so they call it the Cuesta. Getting it off of that thing involved a lot of engineering. And once again, uh, you know, volunteers are always so critical. We had a volunteer, Phil Policelli, who uh, helped design a massive skid, 10 by 10s and gigantic steel bolts that we built under the thing in place, and then uh, cross marine projects, they helped work with us to fabricate and actually funded a lot of pulling it off the hill, as did uh, our Utah Friends of Paleontology Group. The guys that actually pulled it off the hill, high desert excavation in Green River, you know, not too far away, they ended up doing it for cost. I mean, and, and then even then, they ended up blowing four tires on the semi truck, getting this equipment in close enough so we could get to it. It was quite an endeavor. There was no doubt about it. That little National Geographic film clip, you know, uh, gets across kind of neat how, how it was done. And, of course, even that thing, the film clip uh, that Dirty Jobs did, uh, you know, they came out and filmed the show with us there back in 2012. That covered some of the early stages back before we came up with the quicksand hypothesis. Um, on camera saying it might be a, a levee or point bar, you know, accumulation. As we dug, we discovered that could be the case. How did you know it was quicksand then? Well, you know, basically, uh, I've dug a lot of dinosaurs over the years. <laughs> I've been doing this now, a bit over 41 years. And basically, you know, bone beds, occurrences where you get lots and lots of fossils, you know, generally have a couple of normal geometries that you see, most commonly you see, is a large sheet where all the skeletons are. And the sheet, you know, might represent a, a water hole, you know, a marsh or a pond that's lively extensive. It might represent a big blood deposit where uh, sediment blew out of the side of a channel and buried and uh, sorted and transported a lot of carcasses out on the floor.
floodplain. If you related to an ash ball, you know, that came down and killed a bunch of animals. So a sheet distribution of the large skeletons, and we have several sites like that out there, it is common. Another geometry we see is that of a ribbon, where the animals are either in the river channel bottom, lots of skeletons, that's kind of like Dinosaur National Monument, or Hanksville Burpee quarries, a giant ribbon, big river channel full of skeletons. Sometimes the skeletons are plastered up against a levee or something on the floodplain, so they have a fairly linear geometry ribbon, and they have width you know, as well, so it's not a line. But they're the most common things. So as we started finding this thing, we realized through about a meter, three feet, there were all these skeletons. And we started going laterally, and okay, it's ending over here, it seems to be ending over here. You know, first on the top, where things have been weathered down, the natural exposures, we're able to pull out a few chunks and drag them off the mesa, you know, 500,000 pound blocks off the top of this thing. Basically, it started getting into so many skeletons and such a solid block, you know, we decided, you know, let's really try to figure out the geometry. So we dug around it, and it really was 2012 that we really got around it. We had a whole crew of scientists. You know, Dr. Jonas Chenier from South Africa, Rene Hernandez from the Institute of Geology of Mexico. Uh, you, know, you know, that's when Gertie Jobs came out. We probably had a dozen people digging that summer. And we get around it, and we realize it's a big blob. You know, instead of just going into the hill, and I was getting terrified we were going to just have to cut through something eventually. We come around, and there's nothing behind it. You know, there's this big blob of, you know, irregular in shape, but you know, kind of nine feet by nine feet by three or feet, three meters by three meters by one meter. But a bumpy, we pulled masses off it to the side and below there was another mass that was more broken bones that was connected to it by a dike of sand. It's just like, what is this? And I'm looking at the hill and realizing there are these faults around it. You know, so it's just, you know, you know, what is this? And we ended up going, I, I helped lead a trip down to Lake Powell to show some of our board members uh, some of the research we've been doing down there with the National Park Service. And we stopped at an overview spot at height. Uh, and looking down on the lake, the lake levels are going down, you know, we're in this major drought. And the delta formed by the Colorado River into the lake had really filled in, was right down below us. And I'm looking down on it, I realize, oh, look at these big sand volcanoes in the uh, delta, you know, places where, because the lake levels are lowering and you have this giant wedge of mud coming into the lake. As the water drains away, this thing is compacting, and the water in the grains has to go somewhere, and it gets pulled up into these pipes, pulling a lot of sand up, and then this stuff drains back off the delta into the lake. So you can see these incredible features. And, I'm real, and then you see these big, huge depressions where these things have happened and then collapse down. In some cases, you know, they're near the river, so they're kind of filled up with water, these big, huge bowls. Wow, that's what we got. You know, we're on the side of a lake. I knew that much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, realizing all the bedding through here is all flat bedded and associated with a big lake margin, except for right here. You know, it's surrounded by mud without any bones. We get this sand stuff that's connected to these sands down below that seem to be out of a beach sequence when the lake retreated and then expanded again that's being pumped up to the surface. This is a big, giant dewatering feature. And this is what, you know, trapped the animals. And, you know, what we used to talk about in Mongolia, you know, uh, in the Gobi, you get that incredible preservation of the velociraptors and oviraptors and things. Mm -hmm. And the Gobi, and, you know, they collapse under sand dunes. And they had the saying in the Gobi that I liken with this site, what buried them is what killed them. <laughs> so they're really well preserved. They haven't been on the surface much to be scavenged and worked on by other animals. Well, that's pretty much what we're seeing at this site. That's why all the teeth are in all the jaws. We're, well, we're on dozen jaws now. And all the teeth are exactly as they were in life position in all these jaws. You know, from the babies with teeth that are only a couple millimeters long to the adults where, you know, the teeth are a couple inches long. Mm -hmm. It's extraordinary. Uh, the dental battery, one of these big iguanodont jaws, it's just the perfect grinding surface. 
And we just don't see that in the Cedar Mountain very often. A lot of our bone beds are sites where the animals were laying around for a while and teeth have fallen out of the jaws and, and things of that sort. There's been erosion of the bones by insects and roots and things of that sort. There's been degradation of the bone. Not in this site. I think the incredibly tiny, delicate things are preserved beautifully. It's pretty exciting because you know, we're going to know all the proportions of animals from individual skeletons, which we didn't have any of that data before. There's two major Utah raptor sites known. The discovery site where we've named the holotype, which was one individual, but scattered among a lot of Gastonia, these polycanthi ankylosaurus, but there's only a handful of bones, but they're all from one individual. So since the leg bones, skull bones, vertebra, you know, things, circle claws, you know, we're able to define the animal pretty nicely. So it's, you know, it's a valid tax. Everybody accepts that Utah Raptor's not just a big Deinonychus like Jack Horner. You know, <laughs> wanted to push, ah, it's just a big Deinonychus. And they're losing out on growth histories. And then there's another site, Brigham Young University, years before I even got involved with it, started excavating a site just north of Moab, uh, Utah, a site I'd love to see made into State Park because it's like Dinosaur National Monument. It is loaded with skeletons, but they're all early Cretaceous animals. Brooks Britt, the scientist from BYU that's in charge of the project, he's told me there's at least eight individuals of Utah Raptor represented the site in dozens and dozens. I think there may be 10 different kinds of dinosaurs, but that's a bone bed and everything's scattered. So you can't tell what bone goes to a young animal, what goes to an old animal. So you can't get body proportions. They have a number of the missing elements you know, that we don't have from the original type material, but you know, they don't tell us anything about an individual. This new site, we're going to talk to you all look at the growth history, body proportions of babies, juveniles, adults. You know, uh, in some really exciting ways. And what were these animals like? I'm really excited about it. But, you know, it's, there'll be publications that run dead gone. This thing is, is like those for ranch for steel sizes. It is a Rosetta Stone for Utah Raptor. And the reason we would pull a tarp over this thing if we don't have the right people to work on it is failure, you know, not doing it right is, you know, not going to happen. We cannot have our legacy with this specimen be that we screwed it up because we ran out of money and had to do it on the cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just I refuse as a professional scientist to let that happen. You were part of the team that named Utah Raptor. How did you come up with the name and how did you decide that you had enough to name this new species? Basically, back in 1990, I was, the end of August, I was headed to... Uh, from Grand Junction, Colorado, I've been working on Jurassic site, and just weeks earlier discovered the first Jurassic ankylosaur. I mean, I hadn't even announced it to anybody, but I knew I had it. I had spines and plates and things. Mm -hmm. And we stopped for uh, lunch in Moab, Utah. I finished up fairly quickly. My wife was dealing with our baby daughter, Kelsey. Uh, sorry, I abandoned my wife, went over next door to the rock shop. <laughs> <laughs> to, to look around and I'm wandering around and I notice on the shelf there are ankylosaur scutes I'm like holy cow those look a lot like the ones that we were finding in, in Colorado in the Migat Moore quarry so I go up to the counter up to the cash register and I ask this guy hey you know you got some ankylosaur stuff back there uh, where's that from you know it wasn't for sale it was just on display and he says oh that's from out in the upper part of the Morrison Formation, out north of Arches National Park. Uh, holy cow, another Jurassic uh, ankylosaur. You know, really, you know, I'm interested in this. So, yeah, we figured a paleontologist at some point would notice this stuff, but that's why we put it on the shelf. And he said, but did you see the big block? And I'm like, uh, uh, no. And he's around on the bottom shelf is this big block about, oh, three, four foot long, maybe a foot and a half across half a meter across and a meter long. And I realized, you know, I'm looking at it and I'm looking at it trying to figure out what I'm seeing. And finally I realized I'm seeing, you know, there's a split along one side. The pelvis, the hip bone, you know, the ilium, this big flat horizontally oriented hip bone of an armored dinosaur. And above it was a sheet of completely fused armor, a sacral shield. 
And I realized there's only one kind of animal in the world that's ever been reported with this kind of a structure, and that's Polycanthus foxi from southern Britain. Wow, this is really, really exciting. You know, and he said, well, you know, I'll take you out there, show you the site. You know, and, you know, I was headed to Arizona, so I called my boss, and they went out there initially to find the site. He brought out an, another paleontologist that didn't know geology, totally confused me with his reports of where the thing was. But when I finally got out there, I realized that it wasn't in the Jurassic, it was just above the Jurassic and early Cretaceous rocks. I largely could be referring to a research by Dr. Bob Young, who studied these early Cretaceous rocks, published a major thing in the 1960s. And when we started digging the site, one day I found a jaw with some big teeth in it, the VD dinosaur premaxilla on the front of the upper jaw with teeth. I, you know, excited, oh, we've got a meeting dinosaur here. That's not unusual to be mixed in with plant eating animals. And then one day, this guy, Carl Lamani, kind of yells over at me, uh, Jim, I think I've got a cervical rib. You know, a real rib in the neck, so, you know, I'm working on the jaw. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I'm not going to get, okay, great. And another hour or so later, he calls me and, hey, Jim, I think you might want to take a look at this. And I go over and I, I'm looking at it. And also I see this groove on the side of it. That's the front end of a big claw. And I lay my head down on the rock and realize it's a very flat claw. <laughs> uh, I said, we're taking, we're not leaving here till I get that out of the ground today. It was our last day in the dig that year. And about oh, another hour or so, he uncovered the whole top, got a picture. Very tip of it was missing, you know, the discovery mark. But pretty much completely intact, big claw, nine inches around on the outer curve. You know, and I, stop, I go up to camp that afternoon, uh, you know, we got it jacketed, bringing it back. I'm showing Don Burge this article on the cloverleaf formation that John Ostrom had sent me because he was being very, you know, super guy, helping me out with literature on armored dinosaurs of the early Cretaceous. And in there, there was a few pictures of a thing called Dinonychus. And I was saying, but look at the scale. This claw's more twice as big as the claw of Dinonychus. And Don Burge, my, my partner, uh, named the armored dinosaur Gastonia Burgi, Rob Gaston being the guy at the cash register in the rock shop uh, that first took us into the site, Don Burge, who helped me dig it for so many years. You know, you look at it, ah, the scale's got to be wrong. That's got to be a Dinonychus. And there was a mistake with the scale. And, nah, nah, I know that. I've seen that thing. That, that, this thing is really big compared to that. So he said, well, I'll go to San Diego SVP. I'll bring a cast of it. We'll get it prepped, you know, and cast before the meeting. So a couple weeks later, San Diego, this would have been in 1991, the fall, uh, Don, as soon as I walk into my hotel, Don hands me this resin cast claw, put it in my pocket, oh, and over to the icebreaker, uh, sitting on the back door of the hotel where the icebreaker was, was uh, Bob Bakker. You might have heard of Bob. You know, Bob is uh, you know, the wild man of the hut blood dinosaur revolution, uh, a little student of John Ostrom's, not his best friend, let us say. And uh, I handed it to him, and I'd known Bob for years at that point. He's looking at it and twirling his mustache, you know, all the acolytes sitting around him looking up in awe at Bob, looking at this claw. Then he hands it back to me. Ah, it's a piece of junk. Crushed Torvosaurus claw. No, no. You know, it's like my stomach claws ringing. No, I don't believe it, Bob. It's a giant Tromiosaur claw. Ah, it's just Crushed Torvosaurus claw. And I have to admit, in lateral view, it's like exactly the same size and shape as the bum claw of Torvosaurus from the Jurassic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know, if you're saying, okay, it's flattened, but, uh, you know, that, that's a reasonable guess. You know, Bob, Bob's not a dumb guy. Uh, they go, well, I'm going to go show it to John Ostrom. He says, ah, yeah, you don't know it. Uh, he doesn't know what's going on. So I go in and hand it to John Ostrom, who is actually talking with the, the first state paleontologist of Utah, Jim Madsen. And John looks at this thing and immediately says, this had the sheath on it, it'd be over a foot long, and this thing would rip your guts out. And he just starts waving it around and totally, you know, I didn't have to even prompt him, you know, knew what it was. You know, the 
giant raptor claw. So that was that rest of that meeting felt a lot better for me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, and, and slowly as we worked that site, we found another premaxilla without teeth in it, uh, tibia, complete tibia, a partial tibia, uh, tail flattened, uh, tail uh, vertebra that have the long extensions. They're classic pedromiosaur of kind of crushed up dorsal vertebra, uh, another hand claw, uh, a few other skull elements. So it was, we, you know, we slowly, you know, had enough to define the animal. And visiting Brigham Young University, because I knew Dalton Wells Quarry across the other side of Arches National Park was about the same age and also had these kind of ankylosaurs in it. They had a drawer, one little drawer, unidentified theropod, and I opened this, and there was more Utah Raptor material. So I asked Ken Statman there if I could borrow that material, just a handful of elements, but some real nice specimens. And said, sure, take them. And I used that material with them, some of their first materials from the gas and quarry to initially name Utah Raptor. So it was pretty exciting. So right from the beginning, we knew we had a second animal. And the name basically came from the site. The Gaston Quarry was on state land. And I was working for a group called Dynamation International Society, which was a nonprofit group. It had just been founded a couple of years earlier of the Dynamation International Corporation that did the big robot dinosaur exhibits back then in the, the late 80s and then early 90s. Well, you know, uh, the, the second state paleontologist at Utah was no fan of commercial paleontology, and he considered the fact that I had links to a corporation to, to be evil incarnate. So he was not wanting me working in the state of Utah. This is one reason I linked up with Don Burge from the prehistoric museum in Price, Utah. Mm -hmm. He was the director of the museum at the time. So he could get the permits, because Dave wouldn't issue me a permit to work on the site. Uh, you know, I secured the specimens and everything, got it back into public hands. They did not, I did not see eye to eye on any of that stuff. You know, I always have worked with museums. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, there's other ways to skin cats. I've always believed that. So working with uh, Don Burge, you know, knowing that Utah was looking very astonished at me because I was living in Colorado, just over the border, across the Red Rock Curtain, but over the border in Grand Junction. And, you know, Bob Barker, who was a consultant with that nation, said, you know, you might want to name that after Utah. And just like perfect Utah Raptor, you know, just came right to mind. Yeah, that'll make white me better. And you know, Bob's like, and you should name it after Spielberg. And I went to this side of Castle of the Claw when we were in California at Dynamation. Went to a dinosaur club meeting in Hollywood, actually Burbank. A lot of actors and special effects people like dinosaurs go to this thing once a month. It's kind of a pop pop get together. And pull out the claw, pass around, and this guy passes this other cast around. Says, that's the claw from the Utah Raptor, or the Raptor in Jurassic Park. They were making the movie at the time. But you can keep it, I got another one. So I got, it was given a cast of the original Utah Raptor claw, or you know, Raptor claw from the first movie. And I still, it's sitting here right next to me it's on my desk in my office here. Wow. Uh, <laughs> pretty cool. And what I like is, it, you know, it's made with the, you know, of course, there's a living animal. So you have the sheath, the keratin over the bony core. And I'm looking at it, comparing to mine, and I'm like, well, mine's bigger than it is. I've always felt my, my raptor is bigger than Spielberg's raptor. <laughs> Not by much. They're almost the same size. But my claw is much nastier. It's much more blade-like. has a much more gentle curve. This thing, if they curved it too tight, it wouldn't have been very effective for slashing. Mine, mine you know, slice you up and really good, stab you a foot deep, you know, every time it kicks you. Nasty, nasty animal. But I was, at the last minute, the paper was in galley proofs to name the animal Utah Raptor Spielberg Eye. Mm -hmm. And the head of Dynamation comes walking in my office and says, you got to change the name. And I'm like, what? And uh, you have to change the name. And I'm like, what do you mean? He says, well, the Universal Studios is suing Yale because they have an exhibit they're calling Jurassic Jungle, pursuing this other museum because they're 
calling something Jurassic. Apparently, Universal just started suing anybody that used Jurassic as an adjective. And I learned later that they were doing it as a uh, prophylactic defense against people that are really ripping them off. So they could, or someone could say, well, you didn't sue them, but they were just having blanket lawsuits. But as I've mentioned already, you know, in this country, museums have no money. You know, we really don't. There's a couple of big museums that are moderately well funded, but we're, we're really hurting in the U.S. So any time a museum gets sued, it's a big deal. They have to pay the lawyers when they should be paying for paleontologists. So uh, basically, I had to change the name. I had to call the printer and have them change the name. And that's how it became Utah Raptor Oster Maison. For Chris Mays, president of animation, allowed me to do the research. And, of course, uh, John Ostrom, who's the father of the terrible thought and the relation of dinosaurs and birds and started the warm blooded dinosaur revolution. For Jurassic Park, were they planning on making their Velociraptor that big, or was it until Utah Raptor came around, they're like, all right. No, no, they were already doing it. As I said, this guy handed me this cast of the one from the movie, you know, long before I named it or even announced that we had this. This was probably a month or two after I bought the replica Claude of San Diego. Hmm. So it would have been like November of 91. The movie didn't come out until 93. But they were just working on it. This guy was working with Dan Winston Studios. And, you know, they were building these things up. And, uh, you know, Spielberg just like, you know, the animal was supposed to be Dinonychus, still being called Velociraptor. Uh, the great call, lumping them together a few years earlier. But because of that, you know, Dinonychus still isn't a very big animal. Uh, three and a half, four foot at the hip. You know, not very big. And he feels like, there's no way that the villain of the movie would be small, that small. It's, we've got to make it at least as big as that. And so they blew their raptors up to larger body size. And simultaneously, when they were making that decision, is when we were excavating with the fossils. And there's uh, been reported to me that Spielberg actually said we had to envision such a creature before the scientists could go out and find it. Uh, we were like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's with 115 out there, and our blue bottles were blowing up in the sun. Oh, wow. Uh, I'm glad you were envisioning for us. <laughs> So back to this nine-ton sandstone block, when you do get enough funding to properly study it, what do you hope to find out, or what do you think you'll learn from Well, there, there's a number of questions this thing will be able to answer for us. You know, one is, you know, and we have to do very careful analysis. We want to make 3D models of this thing continuously as we work on it. Mm-hmm. And we're preparing the block at Thanksgiving Point, the North American Museum of Ancient Life in Lehigh, Utah. They were only people that had a lab that we could get it into and have floor strong enough to support the weight of the block. My lab has got a small door, a regular door, so I couldn't get anything this big in my lab. So they were nice, and we have an agreement with them that we can work on the block there. But they're not funding it. So at least we're preparing the block before the public. So anyway, as we work on it, we want to make, you know, using photogrammetry, 3D models of the block periodically very carefully document what's going on with the division of fossils. Because we want to decide, is this one event or is it multiple events? Mm-hmm. It's one event, we might have caught part of a pack of Utah Raptors that could actually show that they were packed on it. If it's multiple events, then we can establish that. That story is a lot more iffy if we can do much to support that. But that's what we have parent size classes of animals suggest that uh, you know animals would hatch and stick with the parent. You know, so we're looking at you know age segregation. It might have been one season, one summer, or one spring. If it's not one of them, uh, multiple events in a fairly short period of time, that will all come out of it. So we'll you know make have evidence. Do they pack up? You know, how do these things grow? These are babies. These are you know, hatched that year. These juveniles have the year before, uh, maybe there's another size before we get the biggest one we have there. So maybe by the time they're three-year-olds, they have to go out on their own. You know, those kind of behavioral things we're hoping to pull out of this. Then we'll also be able to look at growth histories 
the younger one, the juveniles, which are at this point more complete, just from the fragments that we put off the edges, appear to be much longer way than adult Utah raptors. Uh, this has been seen in Tyrannosaurus, Allosaurus, a number of big moving animals, but the young are more graphile, fast runners than the adults. In fact, the young animals look like they're even speedier than the Lothoraptor, and about the same size, a little bigger. You know, so we can look at the lake proportions, the other body proportions, see how these things grew, and how their behaviors might have changed today. The adult Utah raptor is a massively built animal, and it's not a separate gasp around them. The ones in walking with dinosaurs are completely wrong, not just that they're not feathered, but also the fact that they're uh, built like giant velociraptors, totally massive. These guys are built like Arnold Schwarzenegger. They have muscles on their muscles. <laughs> and they're kicking through inch and a half. Yeah, you know, these guys are attacking big animals, and they're built to do it, the big adults. So like with Tyrannosaurus, Allosaurus, perhaps the young animals, you know, would throw up the prey and make it easier for the uh, big guys to you know, take down the big animal. You know, and these are things we're going to look at, but it certainly seems that these have different body proportions. But even though I find it unlikely that the three maxillas suggest they're Utah raptors, they're very distinct three maxillas. It's not impossible that there's other raptors and that, you know, there's something else in there. But I kind of doubt it. And we've got to test it. I've got theories testing it rigorously and documenting the process rigorously. That's how science is done. Failure of doing good science is not an option. How do you feel about Bob Barker's Red Raptor novel, if you've read it? <laughs> well, he did some pretty, he was pretty lucky on some stuff. You know, he was writing that, calling me, you know, while I was working on Utah Raptor. And he'd call me, what did he found, anything else? You know, he was pumping me for information all the time. <laughs> and telling me he was working on a novel with a T-Rex as protagonist. I had no clue he was doing the book. He was pumping me for information the whole time. <laughs> but the, one of the things that amazes me on that book is he's got Therizinosaurs up in the mountains, playing in the snow fur-covered or photo feather covered snow bunny therizinosaur. At that time, there was not a therizinosaur known in North America. About 10 years later, or a few years later, you know, that's when I discovered the first one, Notronychus McKinley Eye, down on the New Mexico-Arizona border. And then later, we discovered Falcarius utaensis, the real primitive one, in the Cedar Mountain Formation uh, of Utah. So it's like, there was no evidence whatsoever. <laughs> he threw it into the book at all. Yeah. He and pulled it was a, right. <laughs> he pulled a Spielberg and envisioned it for you to find. <laughs> uh, I know. <laughs> Holy cow. I mean, that was it. I mean, not just shot in the dark. Uh, and the fact that these things, you know, because of Bay Paisaurus and Leon Ink formation, have been proven to have uh, a fur like proto feather coating, you know. Oh, uh, what do you say? <laughs> but he made a lot of money off of that thing, There's no doubt about it, off my sweat. As has numerous, I mean, there's been lots of books on the Utah Raptor uh, over the years, and, you know, not a penny, all the toys and things, not a penny has ever gone to research on it. Have you written any books other than the Star Trek novel, which I want to get into? You know, I, I had crazy problems in that uh, Dynamation wasn't going to let me write a book unless they made all the money. <laughs> you know, like the Star Trek novel, I didn't get any money at all from that. I was able to convince them to let it go to research. Uh, so I funded my research trip on the armored dinosaurs, which was very important in my education. I traveled all over the country uh, studying in college, so it was then there existed. But um, I was told they couldn't do it. And then when I got to Utah, it's pretty much the same thing. Oh, you can't work on a book. You know, unless you publish it to us, it should be write a book and have it sold only in our bookstore. You know, it's, there's no point. I mean, I was asked to do a Dinosaurs of Utah book early on, and one of my first questions, you know, which I totally will see as part of this job, it's essentially, uh, well, how much money do we have for art? You know, none. <laughs> it's like, how can I write a book about Dinosaurs of Utah with those illustrations? <laughs> You know, but I've been, you know, working on this this while. We've discovered so much. I mean, since I've had this job, we've discovered 26 new dinosaurs. 
dinosaurs there in Utah. Wow. I mean, it's uh, pretty extraordinary. And you know, all these faunas. I'd love to do a book where we go fauna by fauna by fauna, you know, through the time scale and get an artist or artist to reconstruct these various worlds if we go through the entire thing. Uh, I think it'd be a very nice way to do it and a very good position to do that to go. But I'm going to have to wait till I retire. Uh, I've been outlining the Utah Raptor Discovery for 20 years. I figure if I die before I retire, my wife can get someone to clean it up and publish it. <laughs> you know, state of Utah, they just don't like your moonlighting. You know? Mm-hmm. They, cause they don't want me spending all my time writing books to fund my work, or they want me doing the job, which I work at home. You know, I've been working on stuff at home, you know, in the last 20 hours. But, and I don't charge the state for what I do at home. It's just. But, uh, you know, the, I described an animal recently, uh, Europelta from Spain, did all of that work at home. Oh, wow. <laughs> because, you know, it's outside of Utah. I knew they weren't going to approve it. Uh, and we did it through the Internet. They put the pictures. I'd look at them and say, oh, we got to turn it around and take it again. And we had a person in Utah, friends of Paleo, that actually paid a student at the U to crop the pictures. They were hundreds of them. Uh, it would have taken me a year to do that on my stomach. And uh, got that thing done in two years, but totally did this on my own time at home. That's passion. Well, it, I wanted to do this when I was five years old. I'm doing my life's thing. It just gets so frustrating that that's how the world looked at it. We like what you do, but you should pay up. <laughs> so you were into paleontology since age five. How did you end up being a paleontologist? Well, my dad grew up in Massachusetts. Uh, and my dad was on a business trip, came home with the, uh, in 1959, last was up five, with the marked set of boy dinosaurs. And by the time I was six, first grade, I was the neighborhood expert on dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> and telling everyone I was going to be a paleontologist, uh, other than a brief, in, you know, I grew up near the ocean, for oceanography and marine biology, stuck to my gums. Do you have any advice for budding paleontologists or even just dinosaur enthusiasts? Well, the big thing is observe the world around you. I mean, the way life works, the way animals interact with each other, the way uh, nature works, you know, what damage a hurricane does to a coastline, what a flood does, burying things, when a herd of wildebeest cross the river gets out. I mean, the present is the key to the past. So keep your eyes open. Pay attention to the world around you, first thing. Learn everything. There's not a thing I learned, didn't learn in school that I don't apply to paleontology. People ask me, what do you do the most? And as someone that's pretty dyslexic, I have to admit, uh, I write more than anything else, but it's like pulling teeth with me. I write three words, I have to correct two. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm passionate, so I just keep plugging along. I get this stuff out. People that edit me, I drive them nuts, but uh, my ability, we all have different skills. I may be tied to dyslexia. A lot of paleontologists are dyslexia. I have a pretty awesome 3D memory. I mean, I can be part of something and totally envision the full object in multiple views. And geology, structural geology, but for me, is the easiest class I took other than paleontology because of that 3D spatial relations uh, aspect of the way my mind works. They have great geometry, blousing out the book. When you're thinking, oh, putting together the various things into a form, that's the way my head works. You know, but I, you know, I write. That's what you do in this world is you write. you got to tell people about what you do. you got to write to get money. you got to write to I mean, try to get money. you got to write the reports on what you do. This is where I get jealous on commercial paleontologists because all they have to do is go out and dig it up, clean it up, and sell it. You know, and then they have money to dig up another one. I've got a lot more steps in my process. Have you ever considered uh, going commercial? No. Hmm. Not. I was brought up the, the scientific method is everything to me. And basically, that's why things need to be in museums. If you're publishing on it, it needs to be accessible to other scientists. You know, things may be able to loosen up with some of our 3D rendering, but even then, we need to be material. We have to be able to visit the site. You know, if you can't test, falsify what someone has said, it's not by storytelling. If you've got a dinosaur with no contact or 
or shoddy. Uh, it's a waste of space. You might as well carve it out of plastic. I mean, that's why it's so critical. We have animals from Asia that have been stolen from Mongolia and China. They're not even sure what country they came from and no clue what age they are. You know, and that makes the specimens, you know, almost useless. Mm -hmm. uh, or if they've been named like Minotaurosaurus among the Agalosaurus, they actually have become huge problems in the science as we try to figure out what's going on relative to other specimens. Uh, I mean, and I, I'm not against working with, with commercial. And there's some commercial guys that collect great data. And there's no doubt about it. I mean, we don't want to put everyone into to the same box. But you know, I'm not a businessman. I'm an academic scientist. And even the best commercial guys, they don't write the stuff up. And the only people that can afford to buy them are a couple of museums, you know, uh, that have real resources. I have almost no resources, a couple thousand of discretionary money a year to do all my science with. You know, but I do it. I volunteers, and I do it on my own time. Yes, my wife. I mean, when I was a grad student, I did research in Xerox instead of eight. <laughs> <laughs> I love PDFs. Let me tell you. <laughs> I know you've been doing this for is it forty one years, and you've discovered so many dinosaurs. Do you have a favorite? I love the Ankylosaurus. Gastonia. You know, people say, "What's your favorite dinosaur?" I have to say, it's probably Gastonia. You know, that was the first polycanthine and uh, ankylosaur that we actually had a pretty decent skeleton of and a skull ever found. There's at least 10 skulls of the thing that I know from numerous sites. It's a major animal when you saw that it was around. And I love the figuring out of how these things work. Where do, where do all these plates and spines go on the body? Uh, that detective story is pretty exciting. But we've been finding, you know, bunches of new species of armored dinosaurs. Here in Utah, and it's been a blast. But Utah Raptor got me my job. It's a paleontologist from Utah, so I can't say that it was a bad thing. You know, just have the ability to do what I do, you know, it, it, it's just wonderful. I mean, there are a lot of people get a PhD that are unemployed, but there's also a lot of us that are employed, but barely. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we got, it's a good profession. We've got a lot of... A lot of big thinkers in this profession. I think most of us realize that we only write part of the time, and it's up to the, the next generation to prove that we're all idiots. <laughs> um, the big thing is I try to tell you guys, be nice about it. We know we're idiots, but be nice about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's how science works. I mean, it really is. I mean, you know, basically every paper I publish is a is a target I throw up, and the better my science, the smaller the target. But, it, you know, infallibility is not part of what we do. You know, but uh, honest documentation of what we do, that's what's critical, so that people can challenge us and take it to the next level. Just really quick, my last question, I just want to circle back to the Star Trek novel. How did you become involved in that? Well, you know, when we announced Utah Raptor, I got a phone call by this woman, and she tracked me down to, like, Discovery Magazine. And, uh, you know, immediately, first month, the words out of her mouth, you know, before we gave her name, was, how the heck do you know these guys were pack hunters? And I'm like, well, we don't know they're pack hunters. There's evidence to suggest that Dynanicus may have been. Yeah. And we got to talking, and she goes, oh, you know, I've written a bunch of Star Trek novels. You ever read any? And I uh, no, but I, you know, sitting around the campfire, we came up with a neat plot for a Star Trek novel and told her this plot outline that I had. And she said, hey, want to do that together? Sure. And worked on the thing. Uh, the big scene where Spock and Kirk are hiding in the jungle below the fighting uh, Alamosaurus and T Rex. You know, a sauropod being taken out by a Tyrannosaurus only could happen in Utah at the time. Basically, I wrote that seen completely word for word myself. I'm pretty proud of it, but it was a pretty valid uh, set of thought processes for what, how such an encounter might have occurred. I mean, I want a Alamosaurus mounted with a T Rex here in Utah because they both occurred in Utah uh, badly. <laughs> <laughs> the only place in the world where such a pairing occurs is at the Perot Museum in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. Alamosaurus, they gave their. Uh, I think it's the biggest mounted sauropod in the world. The T Rex is dwarfed by it. It's pretty impressive. But if those encounters were happening in Utah, we have both and Alamosaurus and the North Pole formation here in the latest picture. That's cool.
Cool. So you weren't a Trekkie to start. Oh, well, no, I love it. I love Star Trek. But, um, you know, and, uh, about the, you know, original next generation and all the movies, etc. cetera, that come along the pipe. But I'm not, you know, fanatic. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I'm a, very much a science fiction guy. In fact, uh, Robert Heinlein's novel, Star Beast, the uh, juvenile novel of his, saw that on a bookshelf when I was maybe in second grade. Star Beast was like a six-legged dragon. And I thought, oh, it looks kind of like a dinosaur. So I had to get that and read the thing. Like, that's what got me reading science fiction. It was dinosaurs. You know, it was, you know, time, deep time and deep space kind of go full circle. That's great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Take care. Have a very good day. I just want to say thank you again to Dr. Jim Kirkland for taking the time to speak with us. And if you want to learn more about his work, uh, you can go to the website at ugs.academia.edu slash James Kirkland. You can also follow him on Twitter at Paleo Jim, and we'll post links in our show notes. And now for our dinosaur of the day, Utah Raptor, which many of you have requested. Thank you to Luke from Facebook, Tori from Facebook, and Dustin, who emailed us. We're happy we we're finally able to talk about Utah Raptor and that we were able to speak with the paleontologist who named the species. So Utah Raptor means Utah's predator or Utah thief or Utah robber. It's from the Cretaceous period and there's only one species. The species is Utah Raptor ostrum mesorum and is found in eastern Utah. It is the largest Dromaeosauridae, at least for now, which is the family it's in, also known as raptors. Other Dromaeosaurids include Velociraptor and Deinonychus. Utah Raptor, however, is a little different from Deinonychus. It's much larger, possibly two times or more the size. Actually, Utah Raptor's premaxilla is 250% larger. Before Utah Raptor, paleontologists thought that raptors were all small and lived only in the late Cretaceous. Most raptors lived towards the end of the Cretaceous, but Utah Raptor lived during the early Cretaceous, around 50 million years earlier. It's interesting in that these other raptors were much smaller, but they lived later, so since the trend is that dinosaurs tended to grow bigger with time. The Utah raptor holotype consists of skull fragments, tibia claws, and some caudal or tail vertebrae, and the largest Utah raptor is estimated to be 23 feet or 7 meters long and weigh around 1,100 pounds or 500 kilograms. It's about the same size as a polar bear. The type species was named by Dr. Jim Kirkland, as well as Drs. Gaston and Berg in 1993 for John Ostrom, a paleontologist from Yale University's Peabody Museum of Natural History, as well as Chris Mays, a dinosaur robotics pioneer from Dynamation International, and Dr. Kirkland was working at Dynamation International at the time, or around that time. John Ostrom theorized in the 1970s before it became widespread that raptors such as Deinonychus were ancestors of modern birds, which is partly why his name is part of the species name. The species was originally going to be named after Steven Spielberg, but as Dr. Jim Kirkland mentioned, it was changed at the last minute to avoid a potential lawsuit. Utah Raptor was formally described in 1993, shortly after Jurassic Park was released. In Jurassic Park, the Velociraptor is half the size, as in real life. The large size is actually more similar to Utah Raptor size, though some people said it could be a combination of Deinonychus and Utah Raptor. Although, again, Utah Raptor wasn't described until after the movie came out. The first fossils of Utah Raptors were actually found in the Brigham Young University's Dalton Well Quarry, which was discovered in the late 1960s by Lynn Ottinger. And a few specimens were prepared out of hundreds that were collected by Jim Jensen and his crew in 1975. Bones from Dalton Well were well preserved, but they had a mix of many different individual dinosaurs. There was a second group of Utah Raptor fossils, including a foot claw, found in 1991 and 1992 by Dr. Jim Kirkland during excavations of the Gaston Quarry. Another large carnosaur was found at the Dalton Well site in addition to Utah Raptor, but it's unclear how the two large theropods lived alongside each other. Also, where Utah Raptor was found, but much more recent, in 2012, there was a new dromaeosaur discovered in the Cedar Mountain Formation. It's called Yurgovuchia Dolingi, and it had a unique tail skeleton similar to Utah Raptor, which had a large flexible tail, and it's probably in the same clad as Utah Raptor, but it's about the size of a coyote compared to a polar bear. Utah Raptor was probably warm-blooded and an active predator, 
several claws have been found. They have a sickle claw, as well as what are called manual claws, which tended to be very thin. These manual claws were specialized, and scientists do not think it gave rise to other known dromaeosaurs. Instead, there may have been an older common dromaeosaur ancestor from the early Cretaceous or even the late Jurassic. The sickle claws were 9 inches long, and the nails were probably 15 inches. It had three fingers on each hand and four-toed feet. And Utah Raptor had enlarged toe joints so that its sickle claw could raise up and backwards so it wouldn't be injured while it was running, but it could flex its claw when attacking. Utah Raptor had blade-like manual claws, which again is different from Deinonychus and other smaller dromaeosaurs. They had long arms so they could hold their prey while attacking with their sickle claws, and it's possible that when they kicked their prey, the force would have thrown them off balance, but Utah was a lot heavier and probably wouldn't have been thrown off balance because of the force of its kick, so its hands were free to help kill the prey. It probably had very strong legs and, again, used the sickle claw to slash its prey, and based on Utah Raptor's size, it may have been able to make five to six feet long cuts with one slash by rotating its limbs and flexing its claw. So it probably could have killed its prey with one kick. It was bipedal and agile, and based on the length of the tibia, scientists think it was subequal in length to the femur, like in other large theropods. Scientists think the Utah Raptor was probably not as fast proportionally as Deinonychus or Velociraptor would have been at least as fast as iguanodonts in the area, though, and maybe faster than sauropods. Like other dromaeosaurs, it had a caudal vertebrae to stiffen its tail for balance. It had blade-like serrated teeth. One tooth was 45 millimeters, or 1.7 inches long. The premaxillary teeth are different from other described dromaeosaurs. It had simple, blunt serrations, except for dromaeosaurus. So Utah Raptor may be in the subfamily dromaeosaurine instead of the subfamily Velociraptorinae. Utah Raptor had large eyes and a curved, flexible neck. No feathers have been found, at least yet, with Utah Raptor specimens, but there's strong evidence that Dromaeosaurids had feathers, partly because Microraptor, one of the oldest known Dromaeosaurs, had feathers, as well as other Dromaeosaurids. Utah Raptor's feathers probably gave it an added lift, but the dinosaur wouldn't have flown. Utah Raptor was one of the most intelligent animals of its time and habitat, and it coexisted with nodosaurs, which were spiny and armored, guanodons, and sauropods. Utah Raptor may have gone after guanodonts or larger prey, like sauropods that were up to 65 feet or 20 meters long. This is because dromaeosaurs are sophisticated hunters and possibly could hunt prey bigger than themselves. So dromaeosaurs that were 11 and a half feet or 3.5 meters long and 70 kilograms or 150 pounds could probably successfully hunt prey that was 8 meters or 26 feet long and 1,000 to 2,000 kilograms or 2,200 to 4,400 pounds. Utah Raptor may have hunted in groups, but this is not known for sure yet. Until 2014, only isolated specimens of Utah Raptor had been found, but there's evidence that Deinonychus may have hunted in packs, so scientists think other dromaeosaurs, such as Utah Raptor, may have hunted in packs too. Dr. Jim Kirkland talked about his 9-ton block of sandstone with the Utah Raptors that they're currently trying to study, but just to quickly go over again, in 2014, that block was excavated. It took about 10 years to excavate. Dr. Kirkland heard about the site in 2001 when a geology student found what looked like a human arm bone, but it turned out to be part of a dinosaur foot, and it was a hollow bone, which meant it was a carnivore. There have been a bunch of Utah raptors found together in all different ages. The fossils are packed in tight, some are stacked three feet thick. So they may have died together or at different times in quicksand. Again, it's one of the things they hope to find out in the study. And again, as Dr. Jim Kirkland said, they're so well preserved, probably because whatever killed them also preserved them. The bones are in sandstone and red mudstone, and then the Cretaceous lake surrounded the area. And as the lakes drained, it would have turned the ground into quicksand. According to paleontologist Stephen Brousset from the University of Edinburgh, dromaeosaurs are some of the rarest dinosaurs in the North American fossil record, so this is a big find. Also in the area was an iguanodont, which the sense, one of the theories, is it may have attracted the Utah raptors to the site. Because of Jurassic Park, raptors are often depicted as pack hunters, but there's not much actual evidence for it. The best evidence is a trackway in China that appears to show a group of dromaeosaurs going after an iguanodontian, so this find may determine whether Utah raptor hunted in packs or not. One way to see is if the skeletons show interweaving or the degree the bones were damaged by sun and exposure before being buried shows if they're buried at the same time or at different times. 
but this will take years to study fully and also a lot of funding. You can see pictures at stgeorgeutah.com and we'll post a link in our show notes so you can see what the 9-ton block looks like. Again, as Dr. Jim Kirkland said in his interview, Dr. Robert Bacher kind of suggested the name for the Utah Raptor genus. He, at the time, I believe, was consulting with the Jurassic Park crew, and he wrote a novel that was published in 1995 called Raptor Red, which is a novel about Utah raptors. It's told from the point of view of a Utah raptor called Raptor Red, using many of his theories about dinosaur behaviors, intelligence, and habitats, as well as based on studies of modern animals. It follows a year of Red's life, where she loses her mate, finds her sister, struggles to survive, and Baca was inspired by Ernest Thompson Seton's works, which show life through the point of view of predators. His goal was to portray predators as more than just evil, and make people empathize with them more. It got mostly positive feedback, but some critics thought the public would think his theories on Utah raptors were fact instead of made up. Although, again, like Dr. Jim Kirkland pointed out in his interview, he uh, came up with some theories and 10 years later, they found out that it was true. One reviewer compared Raptor Red to Pride and Prejudice, since Red's sister does not approve of Red's new mate. And interestingly, Daily Variety reported in 1996 that producer Robert Homme Sr. made deals with Jim Henson's Creature Shop to adapt Raptor Red, as well as Animal Farm, but there were no official projects announced, although that would be really awesome to see. Utah Raptor has been in the media a lot. In 1999, it was in BBC's Walking with Dinosaurs, but unfortunately, there were few inaccuracies, such as portraying Utah raptors living in Europe, and it's only been found in the U.S. Although, there are a lot of dinosaurs in North America that had similar-looking relatives in Europe and Asia during the Cretaceous because of the continental drift, Utah raptors' counterpart was Achillobator, a smaller version that lived in Central Asia and had extra thick Achilles tendons in its heels. If you want to see Utah Raptor, you can go to the Natural History Museum of Utah, Brigham Young University Museum of Paleontology, and Utah State University Eastern Prehistoric Museum. So just to quickly go over Utah Raptor's family, the dromaeosaurs, they're known as swift lizards. They had unique wrist joints that allowed hands to pivot sideways, similar to a bird folding its wing. And dromaeosaurs are evidence the dinosaurs were active and related to birds and probably warm-blooded. Dromaeosaurine is a subfamily of Dromaeosauridae, and another subfamily is Velociraptorine. Dromaeosaurines have stout, box-shaped skulls compared to other subfamilies of Dromaeosaurids that had narrow snouts, and Dromaeosaurines had thicker legs that were built for strength, not necessarily speed. Dromaeosaurines lived in the U.S. and Canada, Mongolia, and possibly Denmark and Ethiopia. Teeth have been found in Ethiopia, and it may have been a Dromaeosaurine from the late Jurassic. Again, late Cretaceous dromaeosaurines were small, about 1.8 meters or 6 feet long. And our fun fact of the day is that Cenosauropteryx, which means Chinese reptilian wing, and was described in 1996, was the first dinosaur taxon outside of Aviale with evidence of feathers. Thank you for listening, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at inodino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to inodino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at inodino.